morning. It is so nice to have each and every one of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study in Philippians chapter 3 this week. So I would invite you, if you've got your Bible handy, to just go ahead and, and pick it up and begin turning to Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, where we'll pick up in just a few minutes. But as usual, we want to open our study with the word of prayer. Uh, I know wherever you are, God is there with you now as well as he is here with me. And I will lead you in prayer, but I invite you to lift up your own personal prayer requests to God at this time, asking him to take care of anything that is that is troubling you in your life, that is keeping you from experiencing the joy that that uh, which is the theme of our study in Philippians, having joy in knowing Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to, to come here, to, to be with you, Lord, to, to hear your voice and, and have you guide us, Lord, as we open your scriptures this morning. Lord, guide us in these passages. Help us, Lord, to understand the, tr the timeless truths that are in those passages. Help us, Lord, to understand how you would have us each personally to take these principles and apply them in our lives. Lord, guide us now in our ways that we live our lives through these scriptures and through our life experience with you. Lord, we, we ask that, that you would heal those whom we love who are, are, are sick. Lord, we know all healing comes from you, and we ask, Lord, that you would provide the healing that each and every one of them needs according to your will. Lord God, we we also look at our nation and in, at our world, and we and we see what a terrible uh, predicament that the world is in, and our nation is in, and our communities are in because we do not know you. We do not understand and your principles for living complete. Lord, we do, we would just ask for a revival to sweep across our community. These are nation world leadership would begin to, to, to rule and to govern according to your principles that are written in your word. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, if you're there in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. I just have a couple of things to preface our Bible study with this morning. You know, as a Bible, as a child matures, he or she learns to behave more and more independently. But the degree of responsibility that the child is granted by his or her parents depends directly upon what is motivating and is true of adults in our jobs. What drives you, goals in life? What, are you tr what do you want to get from your job and what are you willing to contribute to the success of your job? The same is true spiritually for every single person. A person who is driven to more completely know God personally and to learn his ways will be set free from sin and will find life. Back in our lesson last week, we looked at Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, where it says, have this attitude in yourself. We're finding joy and peace in our lives is to have an attitude like that of Jesus Christ. 
So let's let's go ahead and let's let's stay with that theme and let's go down in chapter three. This thing that Paul Paul warns the church at Philip. Pi and churches today again that's the very first thing he warns us against to so watch out for people who are teaching what they call truth which, which is not scriptural it is not biblically based in his day there were a group of jews who were coming around after he established new churches professing that they believed in jesus as the messiah but teaching the church a different, what Paul calls a different gospel, a false works-based salvation. Paul's going to talk to them a little bit about this. As we know in the, the church that Paul established in Galatia, he wrote a letter to them in Galatians, the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ says that we are saved by God's grace alone not by one single good work that we have ever done or ever hoped to do. We are saved by God's grace alone. Verse 1 in chapter 3, we read Paul writing, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Okay, his, his bottom line is rejoice in the Lord. That's how we should be living our lives. We should be living our lives in joy, rejoicing in the Lord the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble for me. It is a safeguard for you. Verse 2, Paul, in talking now about being where, beware of false teachers, he says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. And here he is talking about those those Judaizers, them who were teaching people that before they could be saved, they might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but still before they could be saved, they needed to, all of their men needed to be circumcised, and they needed to study, have an in-depth study of the Old Testament scriptures to understand how you should live righteously. Now, in verse number two that we looked at just a moment, just previous to this, verse number one, verse number one, Paul is telling us to live in joy or to rejoice in the Lord, okay? It's key that we keep those words together. If we're going to find joy, it has to be in the Lord, okay? The Greek word translated rejoice there is kairo. It's the same word from which we get our English word charismatic, which the English word means to be excited, to be enthusiastic, to be exuberant, okay? The, the meaning of the Greek word kairo is to be delighted or thrilled, to be joyful as we live life. Paul repeatedly tells believers in the book of Philippians that we should find our joy, our delight in life by drawing close to Jesus Christ in prayer and meditation on Scripture and service inside Christ's church. Paul gave a veritable dissertation on rejoicing to the Corinthian church where they were being repeatedly attacked from different false teachers who were coming into the church while Paul was absent, 
one after another, teaching false doctrine and a false gospel. The believer must maintain himself or herself in a mental attitude always of seeking a nearness to Christ in order to successfully face the attacks of false teaching and to at the same time remain excited, enthusiastic, and exuberant in our faith and our work for the Lord. Now going back to verse number two, Paul has some names for these Judaizers, okay, or these false teachers. First, he calls them dogs. Now, this is an ironic label since the, the, since the Judaizers often referred using this same word to the Gentiles as dogs. Now, in their day, wild dogs and as we will find out in our own lives, false teachers run packs. They run in groups. They find strength in number. They will try to overwhelm you with having more people showing their opinion than you can find showing your opinion. And they would run in the they run in these packs and they attack in a coordinated, vicious fashion. Then he says he calls them evil workers, or this is the name for false teachers, where they deny the grace of God and the works of Christ in salvation, instead substituting human effort to attain that salvation by good works. And in that respect, they were evil workers because they were telling lies. They were deceiving people. False circumcision speak, translates a single Greek word literally meaning cut to pieces. Okay, he calls them the false circumcision. So he, Paul is using a word play here where he calls these false teachers the false circumcision, and he says that they are literally mutilating. Okay, they're mutilating the truth about Jesus Christ. The Greek word used for real circumcision or, or true circumcision means cutting around, trimming off what is not needed. In almost every city where he preached, Paul, Paul faced these Judaizers who insisted that Gentiles be circumcised for salvation. This is legalism. Okay. And we'll face legalism in every single one of these false teachers. They will try to add something to or take something away from the gospel message based on a very legal observation that they, that they make in confining their viewpoint of God. Okay. Now. We as Christians today are going to see these false teachers. In fact, we see them everywhere we go. And there's a hostility in each one of these against true Christianity. And then those who hold the true name of Christ Jesus. And examples are Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses. Islam, Christian science, atheism, and Eastern mysticism. All are trying to divert people away from the truth in real Christianity. But those who live by faith in Jesus Christ, we must always be careful to know the truth, first of all, and to place our faith in the truth always. Okay, now in verse 3, it says, For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. None. The true circumcision are the people of God, which is ironic since the Judaizers believed 
they simply by their birthright were the people of God. They were born as Jews, and they thought that made them the people of God. We find the law of Moses says the true circumcision is circumcision of the heart. It also says it is the true salvation. Let's, let's look at that in Deuteronomy 10, verses 16 through 18. We read, Moses saying, so circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality or, nor take a bribe. He executes judgment, I mean, justice for the orphan and the widow. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow. And listen to this, and shows his love for the alien. Now, the aliens to the Jewish people, that, or the, the Hebrew people that he was writing to at the time, were Gentiles, people who were non-Hebrew, who were outside the country of Israel, saying that the Lord our God shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. Now we come to Deuteronomy 30, verses 6 through 7, where we read, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, so that you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. True believers in Christ are the ones who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What does that mean to you? We, as believers in Jesus Christ, true Christians, are the ones who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What does that mean exactly to you and I in light of what we just read out of the Old Testament scriptures? Only after the Spirit of God regenerates our heart, the heart of the believer, can a person personally know God and find true fulfillment in doing the work of Christ? Come down to Titus chapter 3, verse 5, where we read Paul write in this letter that he wrote, God our Savior saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, he would be made, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a, a powerful passage and where he says that, that grace is what saves us. Grace is unmerited favor. Salvation is something that we cannot earn through any amount or quality of human works. Salvation is a free gift from God through faith alone in Jesus Christ, our Savior. See that in Romans 6.23. With the transformation of the heart or sanctification by the work of the Holy Spirit who lives within the believer, a Christian seek, stops seeking to satisfy himself or herself, but instead seeks and worships God to the glory in Christ Jesus. Therefore, finding real satisfaction 
and peace in life. This is the only way to find satisfaction and peace in life. The word glory that's used there, where the word glory means heavy or weighty or of ultimate value. It is God who gives weight to life in this world. Everything else holds no lasting value and swiftly leaves a person empty, hungry, and distraught, looking for something more from the world. And examples of this are people who, who get, develop addictions to, to drugs and alcohol and sexual perversions like pornography and sports and television and the internet. Their heart stops putting confidence in the flesh and the things that we do and these things that we try to gain, gain from the world. And it allows us to find satisfaction or belief or faith completely in the work of Christ. And in our relationship, with God that is developed through his Holy Spirit who lives within us, we can finally find fulfillment in the things that God gives us to do on this earth. Going back to our text of Philippians, we go to verse 4, we read, all Paul writes, although I myself might have of confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. All had made a study of God's law, and he had worked diligently to practice every aspect of the law as he saw it in the Old Testament. But now that he had found Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Paul found that not that only God's grace, his undeserved favor through faith in Jesus Christ, makes entrance into the kingdom and brings real peace and fulfillment. And this is possible for anyone, the Jew or the Gentile, regardless of earthly status or personal achievements. And, and Paul says, he's going to come back to this idea, but, but he said, if anybody had a right to have confidence in flesh, it was me. And he says, I, I have none any longer, knowing Jesus Christ. Verse 7, Paul concludes, but whatever things were gained to me, all these things that he spoke about in his past, these things I have counted as loss, wasted time, wasted effort, wasted piece of my life for the sake of Christ. Now, what are reasons that some believers in Jesus Christ may not be finding peace in their lives. All had found peace. But yet there are some who are believers in Jesus Christ or professing believers in Jesus Christ who have not found this peace. They, they still, their lives are, are turned inside out by what's going on in the world around. Them. Now, what we're going to see is a three-part answer to that question in the remainder of Philippians 3. So let's come down to verse 8. Verses 8 through 9. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in 
Christ that and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So now reason number one, that people, believers, people who profess to be believers are having no joy in life. The believer in Christ Jesus needs to be willing to suffer the loss of all things in this world that he or she, you or I, may gain Christ. Look at verse 8. There Paul said, More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the sur surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Notice how how affectionately and positively is these words, Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's giving Christ Jesus, his Lord, complete credit for the joy he has found in life. He has complete credit, according to Paul. We come down to verse 9, where we read, our constant striving is to always be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now, going back to verse 8. Paul made, makes a comparison between verse 8 and verse 9. In verse 8, Paul says, uh, in verse 8, Paul uses a word that we translate in the, in the New King, I mean, I'm sorry, the New American Standard Bible as rubbish okay now what that mill really is talking about is sewage okay and and something that is of we count as as of no value okay so in jesus christ we realize that the things of this world that we may work so hard for and devote our actually devote our lives to we find out when we get to the end of life is of absolutely no value whatsoever compared to the value of knowing christ jesus as our lord this is sounds very much like isaiah 64 6 which tells us where we're told in the old covenant scriptures that all of our righteous works that we perform before the holy god are like filthy rags coming back to verse nine in comparison our constant striving in this world should always be found in Christ Jesus. And thereby we will not have a righteousness of our own derived from the law, but that which is coming to us through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith in a loving, working relationship with the Lord Jesus. A Christian is blessed in great ways by God, but he or she can fall in love with the blessings of the world instead of God and have and become conceited and arrogant 
believing, believing the blessings come by his or her own intelligence and work. That leads to even greater sinfulness. Only God has true wisdom with perfect understanding of the world in which we live and the right decisions which come only from God on the basis of faith. These must happen in everyday life. Every day we must be making these wise decisions based on our faith in God and trusting in God. Does this sound familiar? We hear this over and over in, in Scripture. We saw it in the book of Ecclesiastes that we studied last quarter. We saw it over and over and over again that we should be seeking the wisdom that comes from God. This is the only answer. So in Matthew 6, 33, we shouldn't be surprised where we're given a command by Jesus to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then we can rest assured, leave, or we can have faith in the fact that all the things that we need will be given to us by God. Then we come down to Romans 3, 21 through 27, and we find that sinless, perfect righteousness only comes from God through faith in Christ, not by one's own efforts in keeping religious rules or the law. This is called imputed righteousness. So if we go on and we look further in God's word, we see that both in the Old Testament in Genesis 15, 6, and in Roma, in the New Testament, in Romans 4, 3, we see this same message given to us. Abraham believed God, and that faith that Abraham displayed in God, was credited to him as righteousness. Okay, this is imputed righteousness. That word credited is, is a word to understanding this. The Greek word is used both in financial and legal settings to take something that belongs to someone and credit it to another person's account. It is a one-sided transaction. Abraham did nothing to accumulate this righteousness. God simply took his own righteousness and credited it to Abraham's account as if it were actually his, purely on the basis of Abraham's faith in God. Placing your faith in Jesus. Christ alone, God credits your account with the righteousness of Jesus, an imputed righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus is the only perfect righteousness that's ever been displayed by a human being in this world. He's the only human being to live on earth without sin. A believer's sins, which is a polluted righteousness, past, present, and future, have been blotted out or erased, and the perfect right Christ has been imputed your account, written by God, for the day of my final judgment and your final judgment. It is only by the imputed righteousness given by God that a Christian is justified before God in his court of judgment. We see that written very clearly in Romans 3, 24 through 26. Why then do all Christians not yearn for and seek above all else else in life to get closer to God in a growing personal relationship of faith through 
Jesus Christ. Why does that not happen? Go down to verses 10 through 11. We, we see the answer to that question. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Person's spirit, okay, see that word spirit there. A person's spirit is the part of you that extends into the place where God resides. Before receiving God's free gift of salvation through faith in Christ, your spirit and my spirit was dead. And we were hopelessly separated from God and his holiness. Immediately upon our heartfelt repentance to God for our sins and our belief in Jesus Christ, God's Holy Spirit came to take residence within me and within you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Christ and resurrected our dead spirits into eternal life with him. Immediately with that, with the Holy Spirit coming and resurrecting our dead spirit, this reconnected us with God. Through his Holy Spirit, we can now have a personal relationship with the living God. We can we can speak to him, and he hears us, and he speaks to us, and we hear him through his spirit. In that moment, you and I had died to self and to this world. And we were raised to walk in newness of life in relationship with Jesus Christ. So reason number two that we do not find joy sometimes as believers We find in verse 8, the surpassing value of knowing Christ is realized in actually having experienced the power of his resurrection and being connected to God spiritually. We've died to the old life that was dedicated to the world, and we've been resurrected by God, reconnected with him eternally, and we have experienced the power of his resurrection in our connection to God's Holy Spirit at the time of our repentance and believe God. Now to verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Let's sink in just a little bit. The believer is saved not by his or her good works but was actually chosen and laid hold of by Christ Jesus. This is the doctrine, what we call of election, the scriptural doctrine. And this brings us to the third reason that believers oftentimes do not find joy Reason number three is that Christ has a purpose in choosing each person, you and me, and every other believer who has ever lived or ever will. 
God has a purpose in choosing you or I for salvation and calls every believer to press on in the days that we still have on this earth that you may lay hold of that for which also you were laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Good verse 10. That I that I'm sorry, look at verse 10. Church. What is church? Could, could you fill in that blank? What is church? What is what is coming together with fellow believers and in, in a local church body and and living our life in connection with fellow believers? who also profess faith in Jesus Christ and do the work of God on this earth? Well, verse 10, Paul says, the church is a fellowship of Christ's sufferings being conformed to his death. Now, let's tie this together with what we just talked about with, with, the, with the doctrine that we just spoke of, of election, okay? What, what does that have to do with why we were chosen by God for salvation? In John 15, Jesus speaking his very last, taking his very last opportunity to speak to his disciples before he would die, he would be arrested that night and died the, ne died the next morning. Jesus tells his disciples, and this speaks to every disciple of Jesus Christ who has ever lived or ever will live. Jesus said, I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Are we starting to see why, as we come together as a body of believers, that the church is a fellowship of its sufferings being conformed to his death? This also goes back to what Paul talked about with false teachers. If you're doing God's will, then evil is going to come against you. And that's good. And, and, and the evil one is going to send everyone that he has control of to try to deceive you, to make you change your mind about your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus suffered for us. Therefore, we suffer for him for a little while. Verse 11 says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, this desire to continue growing in Christ is sometime, something that all believers should strive to lay hold of. Finding meaning and joy in life is finding your calling by God. You need to lay hold of that calling. That's part of finding joy in this world is, as a believer in Jesus Christ, is to lay hold of our calling. In Romans 8, 28 through 29, we read, For those whom he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, he being Christ, Jesus. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. That is salvation, is being justified before God. Have your sins wiped out and overwritten with the righteousness of Christ. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Realizing 
our own spiritual weaknesses at the moment. Each of us should set spiritual goals for ourselves. We, these need to be tangible, attainable, and need to have some kind of a finite time frame for accomplishment. Each of these will take some hard work to truly establish. And we need to stick to them for the rest of our lives here on this earth. Now, let me just show you some that each believer needs to do. What are some spiritual goals that you and I might need to set for ourselves? Number one, develop a strong, an unselfish daily prayer life focused on God's will and upon his work in reaching and growing other people for and with Christ. If you, just, if you develop that type of a prayer life, evil will come against you and do its best to pull you away from that time that you've got devoted to God. Evil will try to take it away from you. Do not allow that to happen prioritize your prayer time with God each and every day. Make it your first priority that you set for yourself every day. If you don't do anything else, spend time in prayer with God. The second thing, the second, second spiritual goal that each one of us should have is become a dedicated student of the scriptures, just like you're doing now. You're sitting in front of the scriptures. You're learning God's word by reading God's word, studying God's word, and allowing God's Holy Spirit to impress it on your heart. Spending time in scriptures on a daily basis, actively participating in a small group Bible study to apply these timeless truths learned from scripture and life. I know many people in our church who, who can't get enough of Bible study. Uh, they're in three or four or five Bible studies every single week because they hunger and they thirst for hearing God's word. And then finally, the third thing that we should strive for, number three, recognize and fully embrace your own personal ministry calling given to you by God. Just like Paul said, lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Lay hold of that for which you were also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. There's a reason that God has left us here. After we gave our lives to him, he has left us here on earth for some period of time. And there's a purpose. And there's, there's an eternal purpose in our still being here. We need to find that purpose, and we need to devote ourselves to that purpose. Now let's come down to verses 13 through 14. Paul says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What changes would need to take place for someone to become for someone to become an applier of the scriptures? Instead of one, just one who just acquires more knowledge of it. Okay. What changes need to take place for someone to become an applier of the scriptures? Someone who applies the scriptures. Instead of one just one who comes to a knowledge of it. Instead of just being be someone who actually applies it. Each of us carries baggage. 
from past failures in a sinful life lifestyle as certain fears and uncertainty about the future. So first of all, we've got to forget what, what's behind us and be looking forward. I think one of the beautiful things in the gospel, when we look at Jesus and his and his relationship with this of the disciples, they would get minutes ago and they would they would be stopped arguing about that. And Jesus would get them to say, We need to go on down the road. We've got something down there that the Lord wants us to do. And we need to press on. We need to get rid of the baggage. And every single day when the evil one tries to bring those things back to our mind, our failures, our spiritual failures, we need to keep looking forward and looking to what God wants us to do today and this afternoon and tomorrow. We need to look forward to what God's goal is for us, and we need to press onward toward that goal. Each Christian should develop a sort of a holy dis discontentment that he or she feels that continually drives him or her throughout life in Christ. The Christian should strive not to feel discontent with the place and and financial or physical circumstances where God has placed him or to serve the Lord. We need to be satisfied with God taking care of our needs physically while we look spiritually at what God is trying to accomplish. Our final prize is Christ's likeness in the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Though this goal is not will not be fully reached this side of the, of the veil, we each need to make sure we do not get sidetracked by the pursuit of personal desires or worldly goals. The growth and closeness of our relationship with Jesus Christ should always be our priority. Come on down to verse 15. Let us therefore. As many as are perfect have this attitude. And if in anything you have a pain, this means don't backslide. Go, don't go back to the filth that we were living in before, but to stay with God in this perfect place, this mature spiritual behavior that we've developed, that God's developed within us as we've cooperated with God's Holy Spirit. The question is, are you obedient to that which you already know? Verse 16 says, however, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Before a believer can realize God's new revelation in righteousness, the Greek word for living refers to walking in a, along a line, putting one foot in front of another. Jesus Christ must strive to stay on that line and not to deviate to the right or the left, morally or ethically. Therefore, the believer will keep progressing in sanctification by the same principles that have brought you or I to this point in our spiritual growth. Christians have attained this kind of righteousness through cooperation with God's Holy Spirit, who is living within us and guiding us according to the moral and ethical standard that's revealed in God's Word. Now, this, this trying hard to live by the moral and ethical standard is not what saved us. This is our sanctification. This is God working within us and making us more and more like Jesus Christ. So important that we understand. That. In verse 17, we read, Brethren, join in following my example. 
and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Look for fellow believers or brethren who can set an example for you. Then live by following the example that that, that more mature believer, that more mature brother has in his life and learn to walk according to to the pattern that you have in him or her. Okay, Paul says, look at us, him, himself and his missionary team that are living for the Lord. And he says, live by this pattern that you see within your own church. Verses 18 and 19, what keeps younger Christians from seeking out these, these types of relationships? What keeps less mature, spiritually mature Christians from, from finding, seeing these, these people who are more mature than them? What keeps them from following in their footsteps? What prevents it? Look at verses 18 and 19. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weep they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Paul says there's a real danger that any one of us, after coming to know the Lord and, and, and staying for a while in, in, in a local church, and, and seeing fellow believers who were walking in righteousness and, and with the Lord, that we will be deceived and pulled away into the world and, and, and set our minds on worldly things and, and fall away from the righteousness that God is teaching. Our sanctification process stops when we start following the ways of the world. And we've come to a very dangerous place. We, we are no longer finding our glory in the cross of Christ. And this is to our shame. We have set our minds on earthly things to our own detriment. We need to surround ourselves with Christian partners. where we are weak. You and I should partner with other Christians who can, who can strengthen where we are weak. We sharpen each other as iron sharper, sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. One woman sharpens another woman. Proverbs 27, 17. We need each other inside the local church. We help each other to grow closer to God inside the local church. We need to stay here doing God's will together. Okay. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. Where are your eyes focused? What are, where are you focused right now? Philippians 3.20, we read, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of us who are now believers in Jesus Christ and are, are plugged in and working within a local church, Ephesians 2.19 says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Stay with God's people. Do work with God's people. And together we'll work and we'll change our community. We'll change the trouble that is surrounding us where we live. And we'll bring people, more people to faith in Jesus Christ. We'll bring revival amongst us. Revelation 
Oops, went one too far. Back. Revelation 3.12. find that Christ has already written the name of every believer on the roll of the citizens in the, in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. See that Revelation 3.12. For true believers, our citizenship, our name is already on the roll of heaven. It's, it's a done deal. You know, Jesus Christ, you are saved. And you are eternally saved to the glory of God. Your name is written on the rolls of heaven. We're no longer citizens of the earth. We are now aliens here. And we are citizens there. Roman citizens, the Philippians, enjoyed many privileges. We as Americans do also. These are privileges have been given to us by God because this country was founded on believers in Jesus Christ who patterned our constitution and our legal system in conjunction with God's word. And when we start straying away from that, we lose those privileges. As subjects of the heavenly King Jesus, Christians have more great privileges and great responsibilities as ambassadors of the King over all kings. We also endure many hardships and limitations as aliens in a land that is increasingly hostile to what we believe. Let's go back. Let's look at at verse 20 again. Okay. Verse 20 says, from which also we e eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 14, verse 3, he promised every single disciple of his. And he says that to you, and he says that to me. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. We therefore eagerly await the great return of Jesus Christ in power and judgment. The Lord Jesus Christ has the power to deliver us from death. He will save us from the ultimate destruction. We see in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, that the last enemy that Christ will abolish is death. And so we, we understand that that victory is already won that there is going to be a resurrection of the dead and we will be changed in the, in the moment, the twinkling of an eye at, at the time that Christ comes. Let's, let's look at verse 21. Christ Jesus, when he comes, will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Jesus received his glorious resurrected body when he rose from the dead. This is proof to you and I that he has power over the grave. And when he promises that we will be resurrected also, which he does very very completely and thoroughly in John chapter 5. When you have a chance, go read it. It'll bless your heart. And then in 1 John 3, 2, it says that when he appears, when Christ appears, we shall be like him, resurrect to our eternal 
non-destructible bodies that will live forever with him. It goes on to say that when he appears, Christ will transform the bodies of believers with the body of his glory. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for this, this great passage that we've studied here today. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have spoken to each one, each one of our hearts through your Holy Spirit as we've looked at these truths, timeless truths in your word. Lord, you've told us how we should live here so that we can be sanctified and made closer to your son, Jesus, how we can find joy in a world that hates us. We can find joy in a world that's destroyed by the ravages of sin. Lord, we can find joy in this life that's like the joy that we will know eternally with you in heaven. Lord, we know that we are no longer citizens of this place, so we should not long for more of this world, but that, Lord, we would long for more of the world to come with you. Lord, we ask that you would guide our hearts today and every day that you give us for the rest of our lives. We don't know how many days that will be, so we have to always assume that today is our last. Lord, give us opportunity to speak the truth and love to those around us. Lord, help us to learn and put inside of our minds and our hearts these scriptures that you've taught us today. Bring them to our memory at the right time as we run into others who do not know you, such that we can speak these truths to them and help them to understand them and, and mature them. Help us to speak these truths to those who already know you, who are are still spiritually children, that they would learn to grow in you and to mature in you and to become mature spiritual believers. In you. Lord, help us to work within your church. Help us to serve you. Help us to live for you. Help us to do your will on a daily basis within the church and with the church in our community. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of our Lord, our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his glory forever and ever.